All right, so I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Kyle McEntee. I am the Executive Director of Oscar Transparency. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we've been around since 2009. Uh, our mission is to make entry to the legal profession more transparent, affordable, and fair. So our work really falls into two buckets. Uh, we do policy work, and we do uh, work related to providing consumer information to various stakeholders. Um, so within the policy world, we do work with the ABA, with law schools, the education department, Congress, U.S. News, other third parties. Basically anyone who impacts legal law, we try to have some kind of policy engagement with. Um, and in terms of the information, we provide a variety of resources, and I'm going to go over a few of them uh, today that I think might be particularly helpful to this audience. Um, so among those things, one is the advertised, which is the data dashboard, which I will talk about. Uh, but then also, after spending some time here, um, adding another element to this that I think might be valuable. So it's the unadvertised part. Um, that is our podcast, I Am The Law. Um, and the reason I kind of felt like this might be helpful is because Cal is all about engaging students with uh, technology. And this is one way to you know, integrate some really important information about career development into the curriculum as well as into the libraries. Um, so this show, uh, I'm the Law, it is a show about law jobs. So every episode profiles a different lawyer uh, or law school graduate. Some of them are not practicing. Uh, the idea is that we want to provide access for people who do not know many or any lawyers. Um, so it's aimed at anywhere from high school, college, even you know, later like career people going through career transitions. Uh, basically, it, it assumes very little knowledge about what practice is actually like, with the goal being to help people have a, a clear understanding of, of the practice instead of relying on TV news, books, movies, whatever it is. Uh, so far we have uh, over 40 episodes. Um, it has been about two years since we produced a new episode. I was kind of holding the show hostage until we got funding. Uh, so we just got funding, uh, actually two days ago. Uh, we got the check deposited, so we'll be doing another 26 episodes uh, thanks to the Law School Admissions Council. Uh, so distribution, you know, it's available Basically, anywhere you get podcasts, we just got it on Spotify, it's on the podcast app on iTunes, it's available at lstradio.com. Uh, it's you know, had about, I think, 200,000 downloads of the show so far, so it's pretty pretty substantial interest uh, from, from our audience. And interestingly, I mentioned before that the we haven't published a new episode in about two years, but in that time, we've actually seen growth uh, in our month-over-month -month statistics. And it's in part because just the kind of content that goes quasi-viral, but also we've had some nice recognition from, I think The Guardian named us one of the top legal podcasts uh, in the world, which is pretty cool. Um, we're pretty proud of that. Uh, and what we're looking to do over the next few months is partner with law schools and colleges, uh, the undergraduate parts, uh, portions, uh, and allow for the distribution of the content on school websites. Basically, if you have the ability to add an iframe, you can have the content automatically updated at any point. Uh, so if anyone's interested in that, you know, shoot me an email. I'll put my cards up here at the end. Or you know, some, find another way to contact me, and, and we'll be happy to work together on that. But we expect to, to roll that out at at least several dozen schools in the next few months. All right, so now the advertised portion is the data dashboard. Um, so in his welcoming remarks, John, who has graced us with his presence here, uh, he used uh, an evocative and illustrative phrase, uh, said, evolve or die. And I think this really sums up the state of legal education well, uh, really well, in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, of course, it also applies to those in law practice. Um, but what we're going to talk about here are some of the threats and challenges, or as I like to think of them as opportunities, uh, to, to more effectively deliver legal education to the people who need it, um, all in service, of course, of the, the end goal, which is the, the clients. And 
to those who don't have clients, you know, the, the public service that they're able to do. Uh, so I really do firmly believe that the foundation for good reform, start, it starts with data and good ideas that flow from, from data. Uh, so we're just going to jump right into that. Uh, so here the, the data dashboard is, uh, I'm going to provide a simultaneous overview of how this works, uh, how it's set up, and then also talk some of the key, about some of the key figures that you all should be aware of. Uh, so it's organized into a, a main index. Uh, so if you're on the website, lawschooltransparency.com, you click on data dashboard, it'll take you right to it, or it's just data.lawschooltransparency.com. Uh, so it's organized right now into four categories, costs, enrollment, jobs, and transparency. And then hopefully this summer, I'll add sections on diversity and bar passage. Uh, each of these categories is further subdivided. We'll go into those. Um, a good bit, and then each of those subdivisions, you can change the scope of what you're comparing, as well as you can adjust the years that you're comparing. So, just so I don't have to drone on so much, please ask questions throughout. Um, I'm not going to hit nearly everything in the dashboard, so if you want me to take a detour, please just invite the detour. I will welcome it. So let's start with uh, costs and tuition. So here we use a, these, well, these are the nominal averages. Um, this means just basically the, the actual raw numbers used uh, at, at the time. So um, in current dollars, another way of putting that. Uh, so as you can see, compared to 1985, law school tuition at private schools is up 270%. So it's Two and a half, two point seven times expensive after inflation, um, and you can see the inflation comparisons down here using the nineteen eighty five baseline. And in public schools, it's public resident tuition; it's five point eight times. Um, so, as I mentioned, you can change the years. So, if you don't like the eighty five to two thousand seventeen comparison, just for example, on the left side, this is where you can modify the scope. So, the scope here. You can, these, we'll go over those in a second, but national by job outcomes, bar results, and individual school data. I'm going to change the year here to, say, 2011. So this is the first year after law school started to have a little bit of a tough time. Uh, you can still see, even since 2011, um, at both private and public schools, tuition uh, is about 10% above inflation, which is kind of shocking given the falling demand. Um, so one obvious response to this is, well, what about scholarships? And so what we look at is net tuition, which is the, at the top here, one of the subdivisions is, is net tuition. And what, sub, what, what uh, net tuition means is basically the average price paid. There's a few different definitions you can use, but what we're using here is if you were to line up a, a row of 100 students and let's say tuition was $10,000 for each of them, then it would be a net tuition of $10,000. If the nominal tuition was $20,000 and everyone got a $10,000 scholarship, net tuition would still be $10,000. Uh, but what's key here, and I think this is pretty underestimated, is that over a quarter of students still pay full price. Uh, so in 2016-17, which is the last year we have data, 27% uh, paid full price. Um, it's declining. Uh, it was in 2012, 43.5%. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully this is in focus enough for you. I should have had them checked out before. Uh, but so that's in a substantial decline. And this is, students are getting better at negotiating with law schools. That has become a thing uh, where they view it more as a transaction as opposed to a gift, which in my estimation is the proper way to look at it. Uh, they are, attempting, a school is attempting to induce someone to enroll through these scholarships and use all kinds of sophisticated strategies to do so. Uh, so here where we have um, ranges at schools, so you know, they're, they're pretty substantial ranges. So in 2016-17, the range at private schools was between 12,000 and almost 54,000. And that's, net, again, net tuition. Um, so the one important caveat I want to have here is in the public schools. Uh, these numbers are good directionally. They're not as reliable as the private law school algorithm that I wrote. And the reason is that 
we have to assume away a lot of the, the compositional changes between a school that has a bunch of pe people paying resident versus a small group or sometimes larger group, depending on the school, paying the non-resident price. And so it makes them, those numbers less reliable. But still, directionally, you can see at public schools, it's been going down every year since 2012. And especially if you factor in inflation, same thing's true at private law schools. But that's not the whole story. Um, as, as always, when you peer underneath averages, you end up with uh, numbers that can, can be jarring. So for example, at Thomas Cooley, we've actually seen an increase of 58% over the last few years, five years, uh, in, in the average price paid. So that's not, again, the average nominal tuition. That's not nominal tuition. That's the average price paid has gone up substantially. Uh, so. If you click on here, you can, you know, at most points, you can click on a school to get their actual, pro, like a full profile on the school. So this is Stanford, it's just a lot of data. This is our, our, our site for prospective students, the LST reports, so it links to that. Um, but I want to change the scope here um, by jobs. So what this does, so right now, the way this is working is just the national averages. Uh, if you change the scope to by job outcomes, it will break down the net, net tuition averages uh, based on the performance on the job market. And so here, uh, you might expect a, a fairly functional market to have kind of a straight line effect of, you know, people with the worst outcomes pay the least, people with the best outcomes pay the most. And at the very top schools, that's absolutely the case where they they pay substantially more for their education. Uh, but once you go down a bit, it's, it's not as uh, much of a, a, a slope as you'd expect. Uh, it's, it's a lot flatter. Um, and here you can see that. So this is a, a nice scatter plot that plots um, on the y-axis, the net tuition, and then on the x-axis, uh, the, the job rate. And so once it, you can see it's, it's quite flat that way, um, especially if you take out the, the very top schools uh, where they, they operate certainly in, in a different market, although those markets have converged a little bit with the increased discounting happening at law schools. Um, okay, any questions so far? Yes? How far back does this data go? Did you already mention that? I did not. So for net tuition, um, the data go back, actually, so this goes back to 2012. So this is important to point out. So if you hover over one of these little sparkline charts, it'll actually change and show you what's, what's going on. Hopefully that's pretty visible. Um, on the tuition, that goes back to 1985 for the national averages. Um, the school-specific ones go back to 2009. And we have access to 10 years more of data. I just need to find some interns to actually input the data uh, and then have some people put a second set of eyes on it. Because every piece of data that we put in that we enter ourselves that don't come from the ABA spreadsheets uh, gets at least two sets of eyes on it just to ensure that uh, there's ample integrity. Any other questions so far? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to skip the conditional scholarships to the living expenses. Um, I when I think about, uh, on the policy side of things, I think a lot about how we can make law school more affordable. And I've had, I can see at least four or five people in this room that I've had conversations with about how we could redesign a library from scratch to spend significantly less and still serve our students. Um, and so one of the things I've been thinking about along these lines of how do we reduce the cost of legal education is on the cost of living side of things. And so that's why I wanted to make sure when I was developing this uh, dashboard that I devote a section to living expenses. And when I started to actually dig into the data, I found some really weird stuff going on. Um, so this chart right here, it shows the cost of living budget change um, at every law school comparing from 2011 to 2017. So how law schools develop their cost of living is it varies by school, but the practical effect of it is that the federal government will lend 
to cover the entire amount, no matter what the school says. And so schools have a lot of flexibility as long as they're using some kind of reasonable underlying method um, to, to set their cost of living. And even then, you know, there's actually no efforts put in by the education department or the APA to, to keep track of what schools are doing on the cost of living budget uh, adjustments from the year. Uh, year over year. So between 2011 and 2017, we saw inflation, uh, and that's the CPIU is the inflation calculation we're uh, using, uh, of 8.8%. But you can see that the schools that are outlined here in blue, those are the only ones that kept, they kept it under inflation, um, but still increased. The schools in red, they all decreased their cost of living uh, and sub substantially. And then the schools in green all exceeded inflation. And some by an, a ton. I mean, we're seeing here about, what's about 20% of schools increasing it by more than 25%. Now, local real estate likely does play some role in this, but from looking at it so far, it's, it can't explain everything. Uh, we've looked at some specific, like San Francisco, for example, looked at their inflation in real estate and found that it didn't even explain, I think, half, this just based on memory, half of some of the schools in San Francisco that saw major increases. Uh, and even sometimes within markets, I think, I think I was looking in Michigan, I can't remember the exact schools I was looking at, but the two schools were cl pretty close in proximity, saw pretty similar uh, real estate price changes and yet have greatly divergent cost of living increases over this time period. So this is kind of ongoing research, but this is part of the point of this dashboard is to engage people who care uh, with numbers in new ways that make them you know, think, okay, I need to look into this more. Or at your own law school to ask questions about what the status quo is and why it is that way and whether it should be that way. And then here, this is just the actual comparisons. Uh, so this page, you can't change any scope uh, except the years you can compare. So just do an example. So even looking at two years, you know, here, some like this is pretty bizarre to see so many schools. Looks like uh, more, probably more than half. Yeah, oh, those are way below. So yeah, so. About a third of schools increasing above inflation just in one year. Now, whether those are the same schools that increased past, that's I have to actually dive into it more. But again, this is just something to, to consider if this is something you want to look at uh, for your law school. So, we move on to debt, unless there's any questions on cost of living or any hypotheses about what's going on. Yes? Well, just on a broader question, you said you're adding diversity at some point? Yes. And you would be able to do these debts, these things by diversity. Are you going to be able to slice your pie here by diversity too? On cost of living, or no, well, the, the tuition, the, the discounts, the so no, right now. But we are in the middle of pushing the ABA to release data that they have on those matters. Because my um, experience is anecdotal are that um, a lot of minority students in particular, um, again, ending up at the paying more, they're less discounted mm -hmm. overall, um, and they tend to be taking on more debt for right. other reasons. Absolutely. So I think that number, mm -hmm. if it can be made transparent, would be exceedingly helpful. Absolutely. I could not agree more uh, with that. And we've been, so I will, Take. I'm sorry, did I make a jump? <clears throat> I like the jump though. <laughs> so yes, but I'm happy about it. So we have recently been working with uh, the Iowa Young Lawyers Division as well as a bunch of other young lawyer affiliate groups around the country. Uh, so in, I guess, February we released a report called Way Forward Transparency in 2018. And so for those who can't read the URL, uh, this is at data.lawschooltransparency.com slash progress. Uh, this is not linked anywhere. Uh, this is just, so my, uh, I actually have some business cards with this on it. Um, we released a, a paper called Awake Transparency in 2018, and this is 
addressing that exact issue is the disparate impact of law school pricing strategies on the uh, those who are most vulnerable, essentially the underrepresented groups, and also actually women. Um, so Debbie, Debbie Merritt, who's a law professor at Ohio State, and I released some research at the end of 2016 showing that while women reached parity in 20, uh, rough parity starting in 2001 um, nationally, over time, despite the figures not changing too much in terms of overall percentages, women become more concentrated at the schools that have the worst job outcomes. Uh, and the ratio is somewhere along the lines of you know, two to one in terms of the average job outcome rates at the schools that where men are concentrated versus women. And so if you look at the top 50 and the bottom 50 schools by job outcome, not by US News ranking. US News is garbage. Um, but if you look at the job outcomes and sort them that way at the top 50, uh, from the year we looked at, it was 2016, it was, I think, 54% men versus 53% um, women at the bottom 50. And so you have about a nine point spread, uh, which is when you factor in the disparate job outcomes is a really terrible outcome that's masked by the overall parity <laughs> in the national market. Uh, and so part of what might be going on here is problems related to the price paid. Because uh, we couldn't find any patterns by region, we couldn't find any patterns by average, average scholarship as a whole, we couldn't find patterns based on part-time, which was one theory posed. We couldn't find anything, and so we want the data related to discounts because we already have data on racial and ethnic minorities on that, showing that they tend to pay less than their white counterparts. So the purpose with this report, it's a very lengthy report, so if anyone wants to read it, it's fun to write, but it's, it'll take you a while. Uh, but the, the point here is that we do need more data. Um, and those data are necessary, even though we have a very good idea of what's going on nationally and in different buckets, until we can get schools to directly confront these things internally with data that are specific to them, we're probably not going to see any change. Uh, and we saw that with employment data and we saw that with conditional scholarship data. Uh, once schools were forced to reckon with their conditional scholarship programs, and that's a program that requires that someone maintain a certain GPA in order to retain their scholarship, uh, or full scholarship. They might lose some or all of it. Um, but once schools started to recommend that, and their faculty figured, oh, well, this is you know, not how we like to, to think of ourselves as when we're providing scholarships, um, those programs have started to go away. There's, there's still an existence around, uh, around the country, and there are just natural disparities, actually. That's something I can show. Um, So this is the patterns in conditional scholarship trends. And you see once they start to be made public, you know, it's flat for a while, it takes a little while to change you know, the way you structure a program, and then pretty big dip. But if you look at the schools based on legal job rates, uh, those with conditional scholarships perform substantially worse with the schools that don't. And also the students are at greater risk of not completing school or passing the bar um, as based on their, their LSAT scores which is not a perfect predictor, but it's the best predictor we have before law school. So this, anyway, this is, I think, an example of how transparency can really positively affect policy outcomes. Uh, not everyone's going to agree with the type of outcome here that we've achieved. Likewise, that won't be the case with diversity and won't be the case with uh, the job outcomes from the past. Um, but at least, you know, the way we define our, our desired outcomes, it's, it's positive. Uh, so, I suffice it to say, we're working with uh, young lawyer affiliate groups to pressure the ABA to to think more about these issues, and we're having you know, some success with it. But I do think that uh, support from law schools would be really valuable. So let's see. Any other questions on those very different topics? It's a lot, a lot at once. Um, so we were at debt. So 
this is another place where some weird information revealed itself. Uh, so since 2010, we have seen the average amount borrowed increase every year until last year where we did see it decrease, which was a good sign. Um, but what's uh, less of a good sign is that the percentage of graduates borrowing has substantially decreased over this time period. And while that might at first sound like a good thing, oh, now law school is more affordable so people don't need to borrow, the cost of law school is still so high that the marginal increases in scholarships, and as, you, as seen through the small decreases in net tuition on the previous page, indicate that what's going on here is that law school is becoming less socioeconomically diverse, which means that we're enrolling fewer people who come from, the, from no, or really more people who come from means who can erase the need for any debt, which, you know, that's not a good thing. Um, and I, I will say that one unequivocally. I don't, I don't know anyone who would disagree with, with that uh, policy outcome. Um, so, you know, why exactly what's going on here? That's still something we're trying to, trying to figure out, but uh, I started to kind of see this a few years ago, but it wasn't until I put it all together on a single chart right here that, you know, that, that drop became apparent. And it's, you know, a 10 percentage point drop is really substantial when it comes to something like this. Uh, so here I want to change the scope to by bar outcomes. And so you'll, you'll note to, to start at the very bottom, it's a lot of people with zero dollars average amount borrowed. Those are the schools that did not respond to US News on this point. And what's interesting about this batch of schools is that you could see by the color coding, they tend to be the ones with the worst bar outcomes. And the same applies to the job outcomes. Um, the, my hypothesis on this, and you know, this will vary by school. Some schools might have just decided we're not going to disclose this for other reasons, but it strikes me that some of the schools in this list that we have other data from, so Charlotte School of Law <laughs> is a good example. Uh, we know their um, we know their median amount because it's a, a, man, a federally required disclosure as a for-profit law school. Um, so we know it's I think that number was like one hundred seventy-nine thousand um, dollars. The schools that we can kind of feel our way around here, they tend to have those bad outcomes, and it seems that they don't want the accountability of being associated with high debt figures. Um, nonetheless, so this. This, uh, ignoring the bottom line, which let me just uh, make it a little easier. Oh, no, it won't let me do that. Okay. So here, you know, I was saying Thomas Jefferson in the top left, um, it's, it's a bit of a reverse correlation where, you know, the higher the debt actually, uh, the line goes this, this way which is not really what you'd expect, just like on the, the job outcomes as well, uh, where you'd expect that you, you pay more uh, and you get better outcomes. Uh, that's just not the case. Um, so uh, and when you, this is more apparent when, again, you factor out the, the very top schools. The, well, Marquette's got 100% bar passage rate because they have diploma privilege and same with Wisconsin down here. But when you factor out the, the, the tippy top schools, you read that, negative correlation actually becomes a little more apparent. Um, one cool thing to do here, this is available on any, anywhere where there's a legend like this, you can toggle things off and on and it'll do all sorts of fancy things and let you, you play with the data. Um, I should also mention now, I should have said this earlier, but every page will have an about the data section uh, to let you know where we got our sources as well as some of the assumptions that we make. Uh, so, for example, we have a projected debt page. So, these numbers before, I'm glad this is where it cut off because these numbers are going to shock you. Uh, there's no way around it. Um, this assume, these, these numbers assume the student borrows the full cost of attendance. And at every school, there will be people who, not every school, because some schools do have a 100% scholarship rate at this point. 
at virtually every school then, there's someone who's borrowing the full amount. And so these numbers are kind of a worst case scenario, but these are all numbers that are permitted by the federal government. Um, and so the, the way we calculate this is we look at the previous five years of <laughs> tuition, um, and we look at the average increase, and then we apply it to one year out and then three years of tuition at that increase. Uh, and then we increase cost of living by 2% every year, which as you can see from the cost of living chart, it's not always a great assumption. But if someone's borrowing consistent with it, then hopefully they're being more responsible. It's tough to, to know. Uh, and then we factor in, we, we calculate the interest that accumulates during law school because interest rates are not subsidized uh, by the government, whereas at the undergraduate level, some of the, some of the loans are subsidized. Uh, and then we do the interest calculations up until six months after graduation, because that's when the first loan payment is due. And that's when the, everything capitalizes, all the interest that accumulated, and then we end up with you know, the, uh, the debt that someone would have under those various scenarios. Um, and then from that, we calculate a 10-year payment. And if you want to see a 20-year payment, you can click on the school. Um, here's NYU. Um, and if you hover over this, it'll give you a 10 and 20-year payment and then the cumulative uh, payments. Uh, and then this, this chart actually has a bunch of different scenarios. Are statistics on default rates on the fine school? So the default rates that are available from the federal government, they don't mean much. Um, they are very low because any student who is in an income conting contingent repayment program will not default. And law school graduates as a whole are pretty savvy with the law, and so they end up you know, avoiding defaults despite their interest continuing to accumulate until you know, it just points way out of control. Um, not everyone struggles, of course, uh, to repay, but I'm personally just mostly concerned about, you know, that bottom quartile and seeing what happens to them um, and not letting them be the ones that subsidize the success stories. Uh, so, anyway, the reason I wanted to show you this page was all these assumptions get explained. Actually, I think I explained it here, so this is not a good example because all the assumptions are explained at the top. Um, but we also, on our website, for prospective law students, we let them enter in all the information themselves. They can do financial aid worksheets and do the projections for them. Uh, that's what that NYU thing was here. Um, I could be in my costs. And basically, you set all of these assumptions and whatnot. So, uh, so also, in this projected debt page, you know, for the people who often will say, OK, well, yes, what about people who are often really generous scholarships? And so what we do is also do projections um, with the median discount at the school and then describe the percentage they're actually receiving that discount or more. Uh, any questions on, on this? Um, since you mentioned assumptions a couple times, yeah. I do the compliance and competitive intelligence stuff for my school. And I think I know the answer to this, but I'd love to get your take on this. Sure. Um, for all of this data as a whole, what is what is your feeling about how well audited these numbers are that go into the system? So I think my answer is going to surprise you, um, and that is that I think that schools are putting too many resources, and part of it's as a result of the ABA, into the audit protocols. Um, I think schools, by and large, should be trusted with the underlying data, um, and so. That's definitely a balance of. Over here. So, I'm growing over here, but only because of examples like the cost of living piece that you, mm -hmm. you know, and with national jurists, you know, now having that, the established best value ranking every year, right. um, and just seeing the number of schools that were misreporting that that number, and kind of messing it up for several years. So, were they misreporting to the ABA or to national jurist? Um, I'm trying to remember if the AB so the, the ABA does ask you because it appears in your file on that. Right. So they must have been reporting a different number. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. 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 Other than jobs, I mean, I know jobs are audited by 
through a process. For making it the right. right. I think that's more what I'm referring to as I actually think that's a waste of resources. Uh, with the amount of effort that career services students are having to put into that, it is improving the data quality and integrity. I don't think it's improving it enough to justify the amount of cost put in. So we're seeing, for example, the percentage of people of unknowns. Um, actually, I will skip. To the next section, so. uh, well, I wasn't going to cover this. So this is let's see. Um, so, do I even have these? Yeah. So, Where do you get your job outcome numbers? A variety of sources. So, most of it is going to be from the ABA. Some of the national figures come from NALP. If we're going from 2085 to 2006, and then there's a gap, and then 2009. Um, and then salary information that we have comes directly from law schools that make public, um, voluntary disclosures. Um, that's on an individual school basis, but the aggregate numbers come from NALP. So it's, it's a mishmash of, of sources. Uh, so you see in 2017 right here, the, the unknown status is 1.4%. So that's the percentage of students that are graduates that the school cannot track down. And if we compare it to 2011, for example, um, that was 3.7%. So that's one place where there is improvement. Is that going to provide a meaningful, I mean, if students are making a choice on one or two percentage points, then maybe it would have some marginal effects. I like to think that they don't think, make that, think that way. And from my experience with them, they don't. They will more group schools together within a band. Uh, but that's just, I mean, but that's only one example where the quality is improve, uh, improved. Another is the categorization of JD Advantage jobs. Um, part of that is actually a definitional problem now, which is a JD Advantage job used to be called JD Preferred Job, which is that the employer specifically preferred a JD and traditionally hired a JD for that position. Uh, now it's JD Advantage, which is any, any person who is benefited by their law degree could conceivably count as a JD Advantage job, regardless of whether they're the traditional hire. I mean, we're, we all are either lawyers or law adjacent in here. We all see the value of understanding the legal system and the law. I can't think of a job where that's not valuable. Maybe a barista at Starbucks. But even then, maybe you want to. You know, Bring some kind of action and against your employer, <laughs> uh, or well, we won't get into too many political issues here. Um, and so, one of the places this happens is with paralegals, where they are rightfully counted as JD Advantage jobs based on the definition. But no one goes to law school to be a paralegal. That that would be just a, a crazy choice. You don't even need a college degree in many instances to be a paralegal. Uh, so. I don't know. It's, it's, it depends on the data set, I think, as to whether audits are necessary. I do think, at minimum, what the ABA needs to be doing is paying more attention to what schools report and looking for outliers. U.S. News as well. I can't tell you how many times I've got data from U.S. News or ABA on the day it's released, found problems, told them about it, and then they go back and fix it. And that's something they should have done before I got a hold of the data. Sure. And it's, you probably know this, but having filled out the U.S. News report for my school for many years, all you get is a, is a report. Once you submit your data, have you seen this? You just get a report back with right. numbers in red if they seem too, to be too much of a change to U.S. News. Oh, do they? follows up with you. Know, when did they um, start to do that? Um, they've, done it, they've done that for as long as I've been doing this. Okay. For many years. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess the fact that no one follows up is the no problem. Because yeah. I... <laughs> have an email chain with Bob Morris every year saying, here are the problems I found, please fix these. And they fix it within a week, but you know, they're, they're pretty understaffed there, which is not an excuse, it's just an explanation. But uh, this, at the ABA, that's something that they need to be doing. And they're doing a better job of, I will say that. When they first started releasing the spreadsheets, there was major issues. Then they started to send me the spreadsheet early, and then there was fewer issues, and then now, they don't send it to me anymore because they realized that was disadvantaging them in the <coughs> PR sphere. And they now, the data are a lot cleaner when you get them, which is not to say they're perfect. Um, 
because they're not, and there's still problems. And I get really frustrated putting the site that prospective law students rely on, and to have to find out from a school like, oh, we you know, changed all our data because we were way wrong, and there's no record of that at all. That's absurd and like, makes a real difference in you know, the choices that students make. And we have hundreds of thousands of people on our site every year. Like right. Sure. right, right, exactly. So, uh, yeah. Um, any other questions? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just a quick follow-up on your comment about the resources, too much resources. Are you talking about resources spent by the schools themselves? Yes. Um, if that's what's going on, do you have any confidence or sense about how those resources are being spent? Because it's kind of like looking at this thing, Bolt team, and saying, well, they're spending an awful lot of resources on making sure he's drug clean, when the truth is, they're letting him cheat as much as possible, and then looking at what they can get away with com compared to a norm. So, you see, the, a, a accepting the person who's in the room, of course, <laughs> and thinking about well, my school, I, I, I think there is an enormous focus on plausibility. What can we plausibly get away with? And, and right. You just have a sense about how much the resources are being spent on that? I, I'm not saying that like, there isn't stuff to get away with. No, I'm saying that I'm not sure it's worth the resources spent. And by that I mean full-time equivalents for an entire year going into it. So to me that's, that's an issue. I'd rather see those resources deployed in, to service as students that don't have those marginal gains while still you know, allowing for the ABA to come in and say, okay, well, we have a report that something sneaky is going on, and, or suspicions from the school. I get schools contacting me all the time saying, I think that my competitor is doing something sneaky. And I usually look into it, and there's really nothing to it. It's a misunderstanding of the data. Uh, but I, I think that that should be enough. Um, and we, we need to be really judicious with our use of resources. You're, you're shaking your head, so I guess, I, I just don't agree with you. Yeah. I think the incentives are enormous. And if you look at drug cheating mm -hmm. in, in professional sports, what, what they're doing is learning how to live within the system and what's the optimal level of yeah. It's the optimal level of fraud. I mean, it just goes back to George Ackerbach. I, it, it, that, that's what everybody... So, so I just caught, draw the opposite conclusion, mm -hmm. which is if you're really being straight above board, then you don't need to spend resources. But, but the premise that you're going to get more accurate data, I don't think that's what many. Well, people so the way they're spending the resources, though, like the way the auto protocol works is every so they've got like, for the sake of just describing it, let's say they have a spreadsheet and they have to enter data point one, and then they get to describe where they got it, and then they have to attach evidence of the conversation, and all of that. That's the kind of thing that, you know, we, it, it creates a trail for the audit that is done randomly or if there's some kind of anomaly spotted. Uh, and so those are the resources that even a school that is fully above board still has to devote. And I'm just, I'm, just, I'm not, I haven't been convinced that it is necessary because the, the reason all this came about was because of my organization's research on the way schools were manipulating their job outcomes. But the what they were manipulating was not the underlying data, except in you know, a few cases, there, like Tom, uh, Thomas Jefferson, there was, a kid. there was actual evidence of manipulation under, uh, uh, in 2006, I think was the one instance they had. Uh, the issue is the manipulation of the information you build from the data. And so if you could describe your underlying data uh, in one way, and it benefits you, that's what schools were doing, and that's what we put an end to. Uh, but it was never really questions about the underlying data. And so I felt like the, the auto protocol was a response to a problem that wasn't empirically tested, uh, which is not to say it doesn't happen. I'm sure it does happen. You look at Illinois, you look at Illinois, they actually had fraud with the LSAT data. Um, but it wasn't an auto protocol that caught that, it was internal whistleblowers, right? And you Sorry. were talking about J.D. Advantage and every job is J.D. Advantage. Well, here in the district, like we have a part-time program that a number of our students are at because they don't ever tend to practice law. Mm -hmm. It allows them to get a, the J.D. allows them to get a job advancement or something else. Right. It's also true in certain police departments and other things. 
Do you feel you accurately represent that? No, but it's not my fault. <laughs> it, is, okay. it, is, it is, this is the fault of the ABA and NALP for their definitional abuse. And so what we have to present is data based on those definitions. And we have to make choices among what to prioritize. So the question then is, should we be prioritizing, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is what I think the question you're asking is, should we be prioritizing JD Advantage jobs as much or nearly as much as buyer advantage job, buyer, buyer, buyer jobs instead of downplaying them as in some cases we do. And on this page we don't, but on, let's see, on here we do because at the very top of the page, the first thing you'll see is this employment score, which does not include JD Advantage jobs. And so here the, the onus, in my opinion, shifts to the school to prove that their JD Advantage outcomes are worth what they say they are. So how do, how do we, for example, I'm here in the district, right? right. We have, um, I, I have to go through and see how exactly how your employment mm -hmm. score is calculated, but I know it's, that. It's full-time, long-term, bar required, uh, minus those who are full-time, long-term in a solo practice. Right, so you take a school which is a access school which is designed to cost $12,000 a year if you're in district. Okay. And you present an employment rate that is excessively right. bad. Right. And now, I'm not saying we don't have issues with our bar class. And UDC, I guess? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, do you mind if I pull the numbers but up so you can look at them? It is what it is. Uh, but I, I just think that, I mean, I know that we have, you know, a 22.5% is not an accurate assessment, you know. We don't get federal clerkships. We're at right. UDC and that federal clerks won't look at us, but we had 12 or 15 state right. clerkships, but that gets no recognition. And um, I'm sorry, where did you... So I, this is, I just wanted to have a better understanding of the underlying data here. So 36.6% are in JD Vintage jobs at UDC. So you add those together, and we're still under two thirds, but no, it's substantially better than twenty-two point five percent. And please understand yeah. that our graduated class was every student moves at more than one percent. Right. Because we're under hundred students, so we had about seventy students graduate. So, and unfortunately, yeah. because yes. of what happens, you know, we have three jobs come in the day after the deadline, and naturally, that's six right. percent. Right. So I right. mean, I, I understand those numbers, and I don't want to be defensive about them in that sense, but. The, the, the statistics games were very yeah. a huge disadvantage of small schools and a school with a part-time program that's designed to help you know military and government employees get a law degree and, and stay in their jobs. Sure. So I will say on the JD Vintage portion of that at least, uh, someone who is in a JD Vintage job, uh, and again I view this as a structural problem with the definition, it, there are over 40% over of people in those jobs are still seeking another job. Uh, whereas the bar required job last year was 9%. And so for there to be, so basically that's part of the underlying reason why we don't emphasize the JD Vintage jobs to the same extent. JD Vintage jobs though, are the jobs of the future. So I mean, I have this conversation with ABA and now every time I talk to the Barry Courier or Jim Leipold, we need a better category, better categorization, so we stop you know, putting paralegals along with you know, an FBI agent. Those are very different jobs that are covered by the same category. But it would be wholly misleading to put the two together when the perceived value for the people in those positions just doesn't meet what their peers feel about their jobs that require a JD or a bar license. So that, that's, I mean, I, I would rather that category be broken out in a, in a different way. But until it is, the onus shifts to the schools to prove that what I just said is, doesn't apply to them. And so far, the only school that's risen to that challenge is Northwestern. And I mean, I, I don't know who you've spoken to at our school about doing that. I, I mean, that, this is just a, a blanket philosophy we have. It's, I mean, I can't talk to every school. Right. But, yeah. I don't know that our school <laughs> knew we had the right to do that. Well, it's not a right on our site. It's a right to on your sites to say we feel disadvantaged by this. I think Yale does this as well in a, in a different right. way. I think Yale does this as well. Uh, not that anyone's really worried about Yale, but um, <laughs> yeah. So, 
but I, I, I mean, it's, I, don't, I don't think I need to tell a school that you know when they market, they should play their strengths. Uh, that seems pretty obvious to me, and this would be a way that if the JD Vintage jobs you know, are uh, as high quality and desirable, then you collect the evidence and you show the people who are making the decision to attend. Right, but so I guess my concern is that if you do not, if you're trying to play in a different market saying that the future of legal education is not necessarily where the current mm -hmm. is, isn't your data playing against that? Yeah. So aren't you perpetuating the current model? No, because there's other work being done to push against it. Uh, you have to play the, I use a golf analogy, you play, play it as a lies. And right now, my primary goal with this site is to help people decide whether and where to go to law school. And the, the, the legal services of the future aren't here yet. So a lot of people talk about, you know, the, the corporate world is changing on the collaborations. There were 500 jobs last year in, in those categories. And even, and that's being very generous because some of those actually would include document reviewers. So, you know, that world's not here yet. And we, for the people who are making $100,000 choices or $300,000 choices, the more expensive schools, I have to, for them, for their sake, I have to deal with, with making sure that they're informed with their choice today while also trying to set up the system to work in the future. And, and I, mean, I, I understand the tension to have this played against it, but that's just a choice that has right. to be made. In the process, schools that are less than $50,000 for a three-year education are being put in a position where it's hard for us to continue. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, so because, if that's yeah. the goal is to make legal education affordable, <coughs> right. and you're in the process perpetuating an industry that's trying to drive those schools out of business, well, it's a catch-22. I, well, I, I, think, think I think you're overstating the the effect of this on that. Um, oh, and, and it's not just yeah, you. Right. I mean, it's, it's more of a, a general thing, but right. I just, when I look at the data, I'm like... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing with, with data. It's... There's a lot of different things to look at, and I mean, one of our challenges is how we present that. And like on the overview page, you know, this is what we try to present: some of these important numbers. So we've got the, you know, the worst case scenario debt at UDC is lower, but the bar passage rate, you know, on the other hand, is a problem. Right, and so you know, I don't, I don't want to also pick on your school, you know, in a room like this, but like. I don't think I'm going to lose much sleep over disadvantaging a school that has the outcomes like this. Really? It, it, when you go, go and now look at your diversity? No, I mean, I, well, well that, we don't have the data here yet. What you end up doing, though, is we take the students that no one else will take. Right. And then our bar pass rate is part of a factor of the rating that goes on, right? We lose 20% of our top of our class, people no one else would take mm -hmm. in the transfer. None of right. that gets reflected. Right. We get no credit on bar. And then- a AU has the same problem. What? AU has the same problem. It does, yeah. right? AU has a similar problem mm -hmm. in working their right. way up. But again, right. AU takes from us the students that they never <laughs> have taken. Right, and right, so right. And it continues up the line. Right, uh, absolutely. 100%, and I just, it's an interesting set of dynamics that if one of the goals of our society is allegedly to diversify legal education. In a lot of ways, we're turning around and short-circuiting that. In, in some senses, right. But I would also say that you know, enrolling a diverse student body is step one of five, right? It's also producing the good outcomes for them, mm -hmm. and poor rates of employment, I mean, and poor bar passage rates just isn't serving that. And for those who, I, I guess, I, I do believe that we are past a point where, so I, I come from a family, you know, half Jewish, half Catholic. I was having a conversation with someone the other day about how, the, I, I didn't know this about my grandfather, he went to Brooklyn Law School. And I can't wish I could remember who I was talking to. Talking to about this yesterday, but he said, "You know why he ended up there?" I said, "No." He said, "Because at that time, they wouldn't they wouldn't allow a Catholic into NYU." Well, my right. both my grandmother and my grandfather went to St. John's because they wouldn't allow Jews into right. And so that's just an like for the way I can see that for myself. And I think we're past that uh, in terms of not there being a lack of access in terms of schools that are 
willing to take classifications of people who were traditionally underserved. Which is not to say that they are doing a good enough job with it, but schools are tripping over themselves to, to bring in diverse candidates. Um, they're also balancing it against you know, what's the likelihood of success. And you know, to me, ultimately, that comes down to a different question, which is, is the way we protect the profession instead of the consumers of legal services the right way to do it, which is a question about the bar exam. Uh, but again, this goes back to that golf analogy again of you play it as a lie. So while we have a bar exam that's controlling entry to the profession, you have to take it seriously. And that means you know, there are trade-offs involved. But the impact on the individual students who don't get through, I'm not sure is worth it for those who do get through when there are other schools for those who could get through to go to. Maybe we're probably moving, but you know, again, this is a complex we policy can, question. I don't so. want to keep it. You can continue this after. Gotcha. Uh, I'm going to go crazy. Oh, Good. What data do you wish you could get that, that, that just doesn't seem to be available to you anywhere? Yeah. Um, So I guess I will start with the realistic, which is data related to gender and race and price pricing. Uh, I think that's something we can get done in the next few years. So I, that's something I really want to see. Uh, what do I want that I don't think I could ever get is access to the underlying financials of law schools to make better assessments um, as to how they're deploying their resources and also use that data to model new schools and create uh, sustain, a, a more sustainable economic model for law schools. Because right now the current model is, is it's broken, it's not sustainable, and as soon as anyone in Congress gets their act together, it's going to decimate the law school business model even worse. Uh, because there's virtually no one left in Congress that wants unlimited funding through the federal loan program. And I've talked to bankers who will not loan to the bottom 25% of schools. They say that's just not going to happen. Uh, so that raises, of course, access, real access issues on, on, on pricing as opposed to acceptance. Um, so, that, but, so, 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 so here's a good like, last question if I'm stealing the last few minutes. Yeah. Is what's your predictions for, for legal education in the, the next 10 years? I think we'll see a lot of schools close and a lot of schools open. And I think Why that uh, because I think that there's a lot of headwinds in, at law schools, both in terms of curriculum development from full-time faculty, as well as cost headwinds, cost also by full-time faculty who are, you know, have tenure contracts, um, that make it very, very difficult to create a, a affordable, sustainable model that can serve local communities. And when new models, and I want to be a part of this, is figuring out those new models that you can deploy around the country that can actually serve those good ends, and it's too difficult to to get schools to, to change on some of those factors, so we just have to, at some point, start over. So you can't get there from here, you've got to reboot. Right, or at least, I mean, not without declining financial exigency and dumping their, huh? their, their, their skeleton, essentially. So, that, that and that'll happen in response to more affordable, sustainable schools, I think. So, and again, start with your welcoming remarks, evolve or die. So. Oh, yeah, put it on me. <laughs> Call on you. <laughs> we briefly talked about the kind of transfer chain, particularly in areas where mm -hmm. there are several law schools. Right. And what I have heard is that transfer students are not counted in, like, for example, U.S. News rankings um, for the LSAT entrance stuff. Is there data in here that reflects the kind of transfer chain or transfers? Or? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, I got that down. Conceivably, um, the, the transfer data are pretty noisy. So like if you look at Columbia's 509 report, you'll see that I think three of their transfers are from Columbia. So I mean, that's something pretty easy to factor out, but it makes me distrust a bit. Also, I'm not sure I have a problem policy-wise with, with that. Um, the fact that Georgetown and, and GW to protect their U.S. News ranking make a decision to reduce their incoming class by 100 students and take them through transfers? I think the outcomes at George, GW and Georgetown are better than AU's, and so it's not a, a crazy choice on the part of students. And I, I don't think that 
it makes sense to get in the way of their play in that market. Yeah. I know, and that's a, that's an unpopular position. Well, it's a very it's it's definitely a position that is saying to um, a lot of smaller law schools that are minority based go out of business. I, uh, I I wouldn't. Go, I don't think that's about saying. I, uh, if you want to sit down and talk about the trickle down effect of that, we can. No, I mean I understand the trickle down effect. I just don't agree with the conclusion. Yeah. Sorry. Go. Ahead. Uh, on the letter note, you're on the last episode too. And yes. About no. Yes. I, we're putting together a list right now, and so of, of the next set of episodes, I think that'd be a great one. So, do you have any suggestions for people? Do you want to volunteer? <laughs> I think it makes. I think it would make sense to do an entry level reference librarian. I think anecdotally, a, a lot of uh, my colleagues, including myself, uh, went to law school not knowing that this was a job. Right. And so, I think it would be helpful to share that with people. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And that's you know the purpose of, of this is to shed light on you know where are the jobs, what are they, what do they look like. And the way we make all of our selections about that, it's all data driven. It's so no more than fifteen percent of our episodes are ever going to be devoted to big law because that's just not what the entry level market looks like. Uh, and for I think forty to forty five percent are small firms in solo practice because that's where people go, uh, and so that's what we want to focus on. So, but I think it also makes sense to. To shed some light on, you know, there are 200 schools that have all librarians, right? And then there's also firms and all those others. So I mean, it's not a huge market, but it's one that I do think deserves you know, an episode. Yeah. Mm -hmm.